Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? If you can hear me, you can show your hand. Who can hear me? Louder. Louder? The goal is to be not loud so that people have to. So I would ask you to. Thank you. Thank you, Tilman. <laughs> I would like to ask you to take your seat and we are going to start. S'il vous plaît. We still have some people that want to go out. I see some people that want to go in. I invite you to take your seat. We are going to start this session. Thank you. So, this, this afternoon we have an hour to envision the future of internet governance. That's a, an exercise we are going to manage, I think. My name is Antoine Vergne. I am um, with Mission Public um, in my daily job. And uh, what we do as an organization is engaging ordinary citizens into governance questions. But today I will be the moderator of that panel and I'm really happy and uh, proud to have uh, been invited to do that. So thank you uh, for the team. We will talk, as I say, about the future of internet governance and the role of Europe and European stakeholders in that future. Uh, you have the possibility to react and give your uh, vision on that too through Slido. You've been using it in the past day, I'm sure. Um, we will have that um, on the screen at a later stage and it's an open question we'll have on how you see that and uh, we invite you to give uh, some words and comments on that. The panel today, I will start uh, with Andrea Beccali. Beccali? 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 Beccali. <laughs> So I'm, I'm French, uh, not speaking Italian. Andrea, you are Director of Stakeholder Engagement at ICANN, and you represent the technical community. Welcome um, today at this panel. We will then have Olivier Branger, for, who is Head of Unit Next Generation Internet at DG Connect, the European Commission, uh, who is there as international organization and organizer of this open forum. Uh, we have Marit Paloviata on my right, hello who is Director of Regulatory Affairs at ETNO, which is the European Telecommunication Network Operators Association and representing the private sector today. And last but not least, we have Julia, uh, who is Senior Researcher at the Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin, the Social Science Center in Berlin, and here as part of the group of Academia. Hello, hello everyone. Um, we will start by three questions that I will ask um, my panelists. Um, you will have the reaction from them and you keep uh, your question and reactions also for later. When we have had a first round of answers, we will open the floor to the sale and comments and more questions on um, the future of internet governance and the role of Europe. We will step directly in with uh, Julia and I will um, ask you a question around the appeal of the model, multi-stakeholder model of governance. We have seen last year in, in Paris and again this year in, in Berlin that Internet Governance and IGF um, attracts more and more high-level interest and political attention and also more and more participants. If I'm not wrong, we had more than 5,000 people registered for this year. So what does that mean? Does that mean that IGF is becoming a mainstream model, um, a go-to platform for discussion on the future of Internet Governance? or? Does that mean that it is the beginning of the end in a way and that it is being more and more captured by some of the actors and players or even become some kind of tourist attraction uh, where you visit and go uh, to talk about internet governance? Julia. Well, um, first of all, thank you um, for the question. Thank you for having me on this panel on the what I believe very crucial role of the European Union and the European stakeholders in internet governance. Um, and Coming to your question, my short answer is no. It's none of these things you mentioned. I don't think uh, the IGF is becoming mainstream. I don't think it's becoming a tourist attraction. Um, so I think mainstream, I think even so, we think 
and we see that how many people involve, we still have to realize that we are a minority. Um, the people who really actively try to shape internet governance or the digital transformation are still a minority also among policymakers. Um, and I don't think the IGF is at risk to become captured. It has always been at risk to become captured. It's very vulnerable in that sense. But also, I think the last 10, 15 years have shown that it has a very strong resistance in its institutional structure. Uh, so I don't believe that this risk is this. This is the short answer. But the long answer is, I think, um, that there's a, another reason um, why we see this high interest by politicians, by policymakers, and we also see these very high numbers of attendance at the IGF, uh, but also maybe an interest in, in, in other internet governance um, venues. And this is because we are at the moment of uh, transition, um, a moment in which uh, policymakers, but also non-state actors, but also normal citizens uh, start to look for ideas, uh, for exchange about ideas, uh, for input, uh, for orientation, maybe also for confirmation of their ideas. Um, maybe similar to the very early period of internet governance around the World Summit uh, and uh, the first internet governance forums with the difference that now we do have established institutions where this exchange uh, can take place. Uh, and there are several reasons um, why I see this moment of transition. Um, so the first reason is for the last 10, 20 years, 15, 20 years, um, internet governance had a very specific common objective. It was the protection of the open, free, transparent, inclusive internet, and you know all the adjectives. Um, so it was the protection of this open infrastructure, but also the, the, the nature of the applications and services running on this infrastructure. Um, and there might have been struggles what it means, um, open, transparent, and so on. It also might have been struggles how to achieve this, but we still all believed in this goal, and we all tried to achieve this goal. And in the last years, I think uh, many policymakers, but also citizens and people involved in internet governance have kind of lost um, this goal or the belief in these goals. This has to do with the scandals we have seen over the last years, Cambridge Analytical, Snowden revelations, and so on. It has certainly also to do with um, the platformization, the datafication, surveillance capitalism. I mean, there are many thinkers who have put great names on, on these different phenomena, uh, so I don't have to explain them. And so, in some way, we have lost the belief in the open, transparent, um, inclusive internet uh, and its applications. And this, in some way, could lead us to some kind of uh, depression. And uh, in our research on, on national internet policy, we can actually see that it has a cooling down effect on non-state activism uh, in, in digital policy and internet policy. But what is in some way a positive way as well is there is another transition um, taking place which gives us some more hope and that's the transition from what I see as internet governance to digital governance. Um, so many of us are clearly aware of this transition but I think we don't name it often enough that actually when we talk today about internet governance we don't talk about the same things anymore than we talked about 15 years ago. Um, so the issues we discuss today under the name of internet governance go far, far beyond the internet as an infrastructure and far beyond the internet applications and services. Uh, so concrete examples could be if we talk about automated driving systems or the localization of health-related data, we do not necessarily talk about the characteristics of an open, inclusive, transparent, and so on internet anymore. It, has, it goes beyond this, 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 um, this level of the internet. It really goes into the digital transformation, which is not simply a technical process, not a political process, it's not an economic process. It's real a societal transformation, uh, which affects all levels of society and really puts into question also the normative underpinnings of our democratic societies and all societies uh, around the world. So this means when we today think about digital governance, uh, we cannot simply refer to the same values, norms and principles we had over the last 15 years, but we need to reflect on new, or maybe not new, but on other values, principles and norms. And we need to agree on these new um, norms and principles and we have to exchange ideas. So, so to sum up, um, I see that the, the intense interest we have in these venues as the IGF by politicians, high-level politicians, but also by normal uh, attendants, uh, like uh, non-state actors and so on, it, it has to do with this moment of, of transition and this moment of disorientation, maybe. Um, 
And it's, I think it can be interpreted as a positive sign that policymakers in this moment of transition turn to established multi-stakeholder internet governance venues to exchange ideas, to test ideas, and maybe also to come up with, with new policy responses. Uh, but we also have to keep in mind that it's, it's a moment of transition, it's a momentum, and we should make sure that we don't lose this momentum, that not in 10 or 15 years we sit here and say, okay, we lost the struggle for the open, inclusive internet, now we also lost the struggle for a human-centered, sustainable digital transformation. What else do we have to come up with? Thank you, Julia. Um, Olivier, I, I now turn to you. We have heard from uh, depression and euphoria, no, I mean, or hope, um, and from internet to digital governance. How do you see the years to come in terms of governance and also technology linked um, and behind that governance? Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you all for, for being here. I'm, I'm really happy to have a, a room, a full room, to discuss uh, this topic, and, and I hope uh, we'll get uh, input um, in the discussion from, from the room. Um, so the, I think something which is uh, very important, I agree with Julia, uh, there are a number of uh, new issues to internet governance that need to be, uh, that need to be addressed, and one of them, uh, I think is the question of technology governance. So there are a number of uh, technologies that are reaching the market, that are reaching our, our life, uh, such as uh, artificial intelligence, uh, blockchain, very soon uh, virtual and augmented reality. And we, uh, we have to see how we want these technologies to be developed, how we want these technologies to be used, how we, how we can make sure that they follow uh, our um, policy regulatory framework and the values behind these, uh, uh, these frameworks. Um, I would like to point to uh, an approach that we have taken at, uh, in the European Commission, which is to uh, set up multi-stakeholder and multidisciplinary uh, groups uh, which advise us on the development and the, uh, um, and the uh, adoption of these technologies. So you might have heard of Inatba, for example, which is the, the group that we have set up for uh, blockchain governance, or the group that we have set up on AI and ethics. And these are multidisciplinary uh, groups uh, which uh, advise us, for example, if I take the example of uh, artificial intelligence on what are the ethical principles uh, we should be uh, uh, following or we should aim at when uh, we develop a technology as uh, intrusive and as important as artificial intelligence. And I think there is, uh, uh, there is uh, some inspiration to be taken from the work we are doing with these groups and the same type of discussion I think can take place inside uh, internet uh, governance uh, fora. And for that, we need to have uh, a broad uh, community of, uh, of stakeholders uh, involved. We need to have, uh, of course, uh, the civil society. We need to have the government, the businesses. And we also need the experts in the room, I think. We need also the people who are able to uh, tell us about the uh, ethical aspects of uh, technology and advise us on, on these sometimes quite specific uh, uh, questions. So uh, we see it as a quite, uh, as a quite important uh, uh, area to invest in, technology governance. Uh, and something which I think is also important beyond uh, internet governance, beyond the discussion on uh, uh, how we want to govern or manage, not only the infrastructure, but the services, the applications, and the ways of life even uh, that are developed on the basis of the internet, uh, I think it's also important to invest in the technology itself. And uh, we heard yesterday um, uh, Chancellor Mer Merkel speak about digital sovereignty, European digital sovereignty. And I think it's quite important that Europe is not only seen as uh, a place where we try to regulate technologies or a place where we promote uh, governance uh, discussions like we have done this year or the two previous years in uh, two European countries, but it's also the place where we develop the technologies of tomorrow, where we develop the technologies that will allow to implement uh, GDPR, where we develop technologies that allow people to control their data, to control their, uh, electronic, their identity uh, uh, online. And we have launched, uh, in just one minute, I will tell you about the Next Generation Internet Initiative, 
which we uh, have uh, launched uh, two, three years ago with fast projects uh, actually running since the beginning of this year. And we invest exactly in that. We invest in people who have ideas, who develop the technologies to implement the, our values, to develop this internet of humans that we want to uh, uh, develop. So I think this is a, a mix uh, if we want to arrive at uh, this human-centric, uh, this internet of values, it's a mix between these governance uh, discussions, uh, investing in technologies, and of course, uh, regulating when it, is, uh, when it is necessary. Thank you very much, Olivier. Um, I have um, captured two, two words, technology governance, um, human-centric. I turn to you, um, Marit. Um, and I will be a bit more provocative than in the previous question. Um, so what we've seen um, until now is that kind of business-driven and research-driven innovation has kind of worked pretty well. We have uh, seen that when there is a backlash, innovators and regulators seem to react. We have the financial crisis, crisis in 2008. As an answer, we have Bitcoin and um, blockchain technologies. The Cambridge Analytica story gave us self-regulation and an appeal from Max Zuckerberg to be regulated. Um, and we have that in other fields um, of technology, so we know that new technologies are appearing, 5G and artificial intelligence, as you mentioned, but also in other sectors like uh, genome editing. It's also a, a huge uh, development. So we have many questions about that uh, human-centric uh, approach or not. So my question, do you really need that? Um, or uh, and if we need that, how to make it happen? Thank you, Antoine. So, um, human centricity. Um, I think that um, in, indeed human centricity should be a key part of innovation and also when we are rolling out and, and developing digital services. And I don't think you are alluding to the business driven approach or research driven approach. I don't think there's as such any contradiction between these two. So in fact, the two are very much complementary and should go hand in hand. And I think that especially in Europe, this has been in the last previous years, few years, very high on the policy agenda. So we, for example, with the GDPR, with privacy, data protection, it's been very clear that the European users hold this very dear and also from us, so we are representing the European telecommunications sector, this has then become an integrated part of, of our processes when we are launching services, services, etc. And I think also that as the societal kind of framework in Europe seems to encourage that, um, then as a kind of precondition when we are thinking about innovating and launching new services, we have to think about the trust factor. So, no company would be launching services if they don't feel that these services can be trusted or if there are too many questions by users. So we really need to make sure that we integrate the human-centric or the citizen-centric angle into, into our business, business approaches. And I'll maybe take the example of 5G. So of course in the telecommunications sector in Europe at the moment we are work, working very hard on, on uh, rolling out 5G. And it is not a simple task, so it's actually a process. And I think the citizen-centric uh, angle can be, well, enters into this process uh, in many stages. So, you know, you have uh, considerations regarding privacy, uh, of course, in terms of communications and 5G. There's been a lot of discussion about security, which touches directly also citizens and, and, uh, and consumers. And, and also through IoT, Internet of Things, we of course know that 5G will be used uh, to, to a larger extent to connect physical objects to the network. So we need to make sure that the devices, IoT devices, for example, um, comply with various safety standards that we have, that we might have de defined at the European level or global level um, in terms of uh, collaboration. So, so we really need to integrate these uh, approaches uh, when we talk about new technologies. And I also much appreciate uh, the European Commission's efforts. So Olivia mentioned the artificial intelligence and indeed there has been a high-level working group in, in Europe to, to work out the ethics behind artificial intelligence. And from Etno's side, 
we also had our member companies in this, in this high-level working group. So it has been an inclusive process and we do feel that uh, we have been heard and, and um, hence I think also the end result is more solid. So the, the outcomes from this specific task force then also reflect to large extent our views um, as the telecommunications industry. So perhaps just to link it back into the IGF here and, and how do we from the private sector view the incentive governance processes and, and the IGF in particular. So we have made a big effort in the last year as ETNO to listen to other organizations and not only in these internet governance fora but also in our day-to-day -day work in, in Brussels. And we have in fact uh, conducted a wide series of workshops with various associations including consumer, um, other industries, traditional industries to try and understand how we can better take other, other people's uh, views into consideration. And if you want to see the results, I will not take the time here, but we have launched recently our policy agenda for 2030, which has a very specific pillar. It's three pillars, and the third pillar is on citizen-centric approaches. So I think it's very visible that, that we do very much uh, appreciate and, and want to endorse this aspect. And of course, here at the IGF, um, we are here proudly representing the European industry, I think our telecommunications industry, and I think there's a lot of discussion about the lack of engagement from private sector at times and, and that we don't see enough private sector engagement uh, in these fora. But from our side, we are happy to say that at least from the European side, we have been involved in both at the Eurodic, at the European level, but then at the IGA for many years now and are committed to continue this. And it's true that Innovation is not limited to any regions, or nor should it be. It should be a global phenomenon and, and it should be open to whoever has good ideas, so we shouldn't have geographical borders as such. So it would be good to see also more innovators at this fora, in fact. And, and uh, we are here, as I said, from Europe. We see there are quite a lot of global uh, internet companies present, of course. But also to have companies from Asia where there's a lot of innovation happening in other parts of the world. So I think we would be then also seeing better and more coherent outcomes in terms of, in terms of the good discussions we have here. So I will leave my initial remarks there. Thanks. Thank you, Marit. Uh, I get from you the, the word listening, which I think is very strong and, and trying to understand and get what people want to say. So listening is my keyword I, I have for now. Uh, let's zoom out and, and go to the global level and uh, Andrea talking about uh, ICANN. Um, so if we now look at the global internet governance, um, what is for you the, the role of um, the EU and European stakeholder? Uh, we have talked about GDPR, um, we have talked about here the IGF, but there is a Eurodig uh, version of it, and Europe has also a very strong leg on um, innovation, funding innovation through Horizon 2020. How do you see that as connected to global internet governance? Thank you, Antoine. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, how do we see that from, from the global approach? But first, I wanted to thank the Commission for inviting us and for having an open forum there is not just a, a list of what we are doing, usually the open forum format, that's, uh, that's how it's been used, but actually it's a, it's a dialogue on the future of the European Union. And then congratulations also because officially today we have a new commission in Europe. So I think it's, uh, it's a very timely panel. So uh, from an ICANN perspective, what is the role of Europe? Well, certainly um, Europe has played uh, a key role in the global internet, and in ICANN we have seen that. We have seen that during the transition times, many of you may remember, uh, just a few years back, when the US government was finally renouncing to the, to the unique contract that they had with ICANN, uh, and go through the full globalized model of ICANN, while well, Europe played the middle ground in a moment where we risked having a fractured internet. So we don't have to forget that um, thanks to the DNS and thanks to the, the work that uh, all the stakeholders do within ICANN, we have one single internet. And, I, and, and if you look at the internet today, probably is the only truly global and single um, part of the internet that we are left with. So this is something that uh, we have to nourish and the role that Europe 
has in that is extremely key because um, it's probably no longer um, a superpower in the, in the internet economy, but it is probably a superpower in terms of values, in terms of uh, participation, in terms of you know, put, putting the innovation and even in the multi-stakeholder model at the next level. And we have seen that uh, with the GDPR. The GDPR uh, clearly set the standard at the global level for the protection of personal data on the internet. We have seen how much uh, other countries of the world, they follow that, from Japan to Argentina, from Brazil to several African countries, um, up to the west coast of the US, where California actually just had a very GDPR-inspired uh, initiative. So this is something that uh, you know, we don't have to um, discard because um, we are going clearly towards um, a reality where the internet um, is going to be more and more fractured at different levels. And we see that from the applications, we see that uh, even from the platforms that we use every day, but um, we still rely on one single route to that. And to do that, we do that because we also buy into a model of multi-stakeholder participation where everybody can, uh, can join into, into that. And Europe does that in a very effective way, up to the point that we have two Europeans leading ICANN, which never happened. We have the chairman of the board, which is Dutch, and the president of the organization, which is uh, a Swedish uh, national. So, um, I mean, going forward, clearly we will see that um, there will be, I wouldn't call it an arm race, but uh, probably a legal race to regulate the internet more and more. And, and we see that from ICANN. Um, from our technical perspective, you know, we are neutral to that. We have to ensure that the internet stays single at the root level, at the DNS level, at the core level. And to do that, we want to you know, avoid that this legally, uh, this regulation race will fracture that, because then we will lose probably the only piece of the internet that will still keep us all on the single network. Um, you know, the global IGF has been uh, formed to discuss the governance at the global level, but the reality is that uh, countries, regions, they are taking initiatives in their own borders, because still we live in a, you know, in a, in, in a system that is very much based on regional sovereignty. Um, but at the DNS level, that regional sovereignty you know, doesn't really uh, work, it doesn't fit. It's a, different, uh, it's, it's a different language, really. So um, what we want to flag, and that's important for the Europeans to keep maintain this middle ground and to this foresight um, uh, vision that they always have, is that um, the risk of having a legal regulatory race where each country tries to protect its own uh, um, citizens to enact uh, laws to protect pre rights and privacy and access to data can have an impact on how the internet works. And um, that could be quite dangerous. So we are happy to work with the European in this case, but with all countries in the world to, you know, to make sure that everything you do to protect you know, our lives online and um, at the same time, they also protect the singularity of the internet. And in that, Europe, I think, it is the region that uh, can lead the way, and is doing that. Thank you very much. Um, before opening the, the floor, I'd like to um, understand if uh, one of you want to react to other, the other one. And particularly, I, I noted your, um, your point, uh, Julian, um, from internet to digital governance. So if, I would like to see if the other see that point and, and if they want to react to that. Um, from Olivier, the, the question of technology governance, so that also we, we have this same kind of idea from internet to something else governance. Um, on, on your side, I'd like um, to see if the other one want to react on the question of um, um, you, the human-centric approach and um, the necessity to have that. Is that part of this transition to digital governance? Is it part of it? And um, on your point on the legal race and uh, the, the thing that is happening now, if, if the other one wants to react on that point. I, I, I can start. Actually, I was um, 
When listening to Andrea, I thought like, actually ICANN is still very close to this original internet governance idea because they really work on the, the infrastructure, of course, it goes beyond this, but still, I mean, there is, uh, and they are fully agree that, that we need this global approach, but I think exactly what I said before, that we are in a transition from internet governance to technology governance, digital governance, something else governance, as you call it. Um, this is exactly the reason why we see this fragmentation um, of digital policies and regulations, and that we have more and more countries and regions trying to find their own, like their own regulatory response to certain challenges, because what they try to regulate is not longer a global infrastructure. Very often, the problems they try to find a solution for, they are really in the realm of policy field, which have always and traditionally been national policy fields. So they often are in industry policy. Of course, there's some coordination, but still it is something which is mostly done on the national level. Or they're in security policy, which of course is also more a national, like a nation-centered policy field. And that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be any kind of, of, of coordination or a global conversation going on, and I'm certain there is. But I think this is also one of the explanations why we see this uh, increasing fragmentation of regulatory frameworks around the world. Um, so this confirms um, that I see a, a really moment of transition, and I think what is the challenge here is that we, we use this moment of transition and we try to um, keep the structures we developed for global exchange and for global conversation uh, and see or make sure that even after this transition to a more digital governance, uh, we still keep on having this global conversations around these issues. Yes, maybe one, uh, one reaction to, the, to what I heard. I think, um, I mean, we are really happy to be uh, contributing to the IGF and we are really happy to, uh, to come there and explain how we have uh, uh, developed and implemented uh, our regulatory frameworks, what we are doing in terms of data protection, what we are doing in terms of cybersecurity, what we will do tomorrow in terms of having an uh, ethical uh, AI being, uh, uh, being uh, uh, developed. Uh, but I see the IGF also as a, it's really a two-way street. So it's not that Europe wants to be there to uh, lecture, the, lecture the world. We are also here to listen to, uh, to, the, um, to the stakeholders. So listen to the different categories of stakeholders, of course, but also listen to um, stakeholders coming from non-European uh, geographic areas. I, I am always uh, very interested to listen in, into panels where we hear about uh, the, the specific issues that uh, uh, Global South countries are uh, experiencing. And I think that's very important for us. What is their point of view on uh, how, how data should be protected? What is their point of view on how data should flow? Uh, uh, what are the issues that they uh, encounter? And it's clear that the issues are, uh, are slightly different. Uh, it, it, there are new issues, we have to tackle them. Technology governance is one of them, but there are still issues around bare access. Uh, there are still issues around inclusion. We, we had that uh, clearly uh, explained in, in, in several panels uh, yesterday. So for us, it's also important to be here to listen, to understand uh, uh, what are the, the problems, the opportunities from, from the community, from different geographic areas to um, feed into our own policy be it our domestic policy or our uh, foreign uh, policy. So it, that's why it's so important to, uh, to preserve the broad participation in the IGF. And I think uh, it's good to have the IGF in Berlin this year. It's very good to have uh, the IGF in, in Poland next year. But we, we truly hope uh, that the next IGF will be organized outside Europe. After four IGF in Europe, it's time to go outside and to meet the community uh, uh, in another region of the, of, of the world. Thank you, Olivier. I will um, now open the floor to the room, but at the same time, I will pick what you said. Um, and if there is someone uh, coming from the Global South and wanting to give us um, an insight, a mirroring um, remark question on how do you see the Europe from outside being in the lead, not being in the lead, the role of Europe and what we have been commenting now? I would like to take that question first or that remark first and put it at the top of the list. So there's someone that already wants to comment with that perspective. I don't see behind me, so I will turn. Someone? 
one. So you can, you can think about it and then give us a sign when you are ready to give us that perspective, which is, ah, we have that. Very good. So here. And here you have the, the slide or the link if you want also to put questions or um, re reactions online and we will have them on the screen also to pick that up. Thank you. So my name is uh, Mathilde Potier and I'm the speaker of ISOC Italy. So for the first time in this history, as a young delegation of ISOC Italy members, and the Italian Minister of Digital and Innovations are participating to this IGF. That's why we are proud that the Italian voice is heard at the international level. The Italian Society um, chapter and also the European Union have two common points. On one hand, they have both been created by visionary people. And on the other hand, they are both looking for a more sustainable internet network. That's the reason why we are fighting both against the same digital problems. We both hope that the technological sorry, gap between the European countries, as we have seen during the last DAISY edition, will decrease and that the digital access will increase. We both hope that a European network will be available to share our projects, opinions and ideas with the other European members about the digital sector. We both hope to create and conduct efficient and sustainable projects between EU members. And we both hope that the virtual processes of inclusion and homogeneity between the EU countries will be one of the EU priorities. Today, if you want to be part of a great project, carry out concrete actions and promote digital culture and fundamental rights in relation with the PA and access to the labor market, the Internet Society is ready to work with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I take that more as a statement and not really a, a question. And I, I will um, go on uh, gathering questions and statements. So we have one here um, and one here. So, uh, but you were first, no? OK, so let's go here and then here. I'm Alessia from Italy. Uh, I would like to explain you something about the situation in Italy. I'm a member of the Internet Society, uh, Italian chapter, and I'm the president of local association uh, Y Generation from Sicily. As Y Generation, we organize meetings and workshops. We have uh, also draw up uh, legislative uh, proposal and uh, our European petition, the number 0755 of uh, 2013, is still under consideration to introduce uh, in Europe the right to internet access. Our aim is to raise uh, awareness uh, on digital topics. Yes, <laughs> we interact with the institution in order to carry innovation, especially in the south of Italy, because we are a long way behind uh, the other states. However, we choose to stay in Sicily and we will continue to operate there because the South really needs action and we need support. We believe in the power of the network because the union makes the strength. Anyway, we are uh, very hopeful for the future because for the first time Italy has a Minister for Digital Innovation, Paola Pisano, and we think and we hope that she is able to reach the Italian situation. Thank you. Thank you for the message and the hope uh, for Italy. Um, I will go there right now. Hello, my name is Carlo von Links. I'm uh, part of the GNUnet project, which is a project that started in 2003 designing a new protocol stack for an internet that cannot be surveilled in the first place, that um, has an ability to um, root by cryptographic key, so you, can't e you can immediately communicate between people. There's never a need for a third party to connect people. You can just connect one person to another person. So it's, it's a very human-centric internet in itself. 
And uh, to give you an idea what this implies, um, for example, uh, we have wind turbines that hackers find out uh, on which IP number they run. They just scan the internet and they found wind turbines on a certain IP number. They figured out a SQL injection broke into the wind turbine control page and then they managed to uh, change the, the, the controller of the motor of the wind turbine and created damage in the order of billion, millions of euros. So this is a scenario that in a new internet would not be possible because if you don't know the key, the cryptographic key of the wind turbine, you can't even find it. <laughs> uh, and um, that is quite interesting. If we, would we choose as a future, instead of going uh, further in, in breaking a, an already profoundly broken internet more and more and keep insisting on using this completely broken internet stack, if we took the dive to replace this broken internet with one that actually respects um, constitutional principles, human rights and concepts like of that kind, it would actually um, take away the possibility for all kinds of cyber crime, malware, spam. There's, you just cannot make spam if you don't know the recipient. Um, and it would be ideal for Internet of Things because you, uh, those things cannot do any harm if and no intruder we, can reach it. We get the point. So the idea is not to go on discussing internet governance, but to build a new internet, and that would solve the... I, I thought we were also talking about future internet, next generation internet yeah. uh, right here, and I thought this, uh, what I'm talking about, is, is very specifically on that topic. Yeah, no, it <coughs> is. It just the, the point uh, is I'm making... just adding, since you, I, I'm mentioning, I'm responding to several um, keywords that you mentioned, okay. IoT, uh, human centrism, another one is AI. Um, if we have an internet internet that does not allow anyone to collect personal data of, of people, uh, then there's no problem with AI because nobody can feed personal data into AI. And AI does not pro create any problems if it doesn't have access to data that is potentially destructive of democracy and, and human rights. So all we need to do is make sure that personal data never gets into wrong hands. Thank you very much. So we get the, the message, maybe we will have a reaction on that. But before I will um, see online, do we have some, any comments? Nothing. Uh, Valentina, you have someone wanting to ask a question? No, on that side? Yes, here, we have one. So we'll gather that one, and maybe if you want to react then, you can have a short reaction on that. Yeah, sure. hmm? ah, okay, Olivier, you want to say a word? Yeah, just, just a word of uh, reaction first. Uh, Thanking the, the, the youth group for, uh, for their uh, intervention, and uh, I'm very happy to see you uh, uh, sitting in the, in the room. That's very important to have uh, the youth, and, and this is something that is really working in the IGF, I think. The, the, the group of young people in the IGF, and I'm also looking at Sandra inside the Eurodig, are really two active and uh, very, uh, very successful groups, and this is something we really have to, uh, to support. And to react to the gentleman on, uh, on uh, developing a new uh, protocol stack, very briefly to say that, uh, that that is also part of the NGI initiative. The idea, I don't know if we are going to, pro to develop a completely new uh, uh, stack, but at least we are thinking about how to renovate, how to improve uh, the architecture up to the level of the, of the protocol, and we have funding available for that, funding available for individual innovators who want to develop these, these new protocols. And something we really believe uh, a lot in is open source. So we try to follow open source uh, logics because this is how the protocol can remain secure. It's, you develop a new protocol, it's good, and then it's improved by the, by the community. So we go in that, uh, in that direction. I will not go into that, but I would disagree with your latest statement. Uh, on, on personal data and AI. I think if it's properly protected, uh, we should be able to process also uh, uh, personal data and feed it into, the, into AI. I mean, AI will work also uh, if we have uh, not only uh, machine data, but also data from, uh, from citizens, if you think about healthcare data. And then you may want to have a number of uh, safeguards around anonymization, etc. But I think that the, if we want AI to function, uh, the access, the flow of data is going to be very important. 
Thank you very much. I will let you discuss uh, that tonight, uh, both of you during the, the evening, uh, because it is a very interesting question. One question here, then I have one here and one there. Thanks so much. Uh, no statement, just a question, critical question though. Um, I was struck by uh, the panel seeming to suggest that uh, Europe is not uh, does not have a strong digital economy and that it would mainly set an example in terms of values and maybe regulation. Did I misunderstand that? Does Europe have to be a powerful you know, digital economic power as well to then be effective in setting an example for uh, internet governance more broadly? And if so, how does it do that? Because it is probably true that you know, so far uh, European enterprises' products cannot keep up with the big American platforms and Chinese platforms. Thank you very much. So, thank you for this question. We had that as we prepared um, the, the discussion of today. We had exactly that discussion. So, I would like maybe you, you want to react on that first, or and then Andrea, because you were also talking about that before. Yes, so um, thanks for your question. And um, as I already, I hope it was clear from my previous statement that we do believe that at least in the telecommunications sector, we have a strong European, uh, well, competence in this sector. Both in that we have um, a lot of large operators. We have a lot of operators in Europe in general. You may claim that the sector is fragmented, so it's not so easy to say that, okay, we have one telco kind of giant or, or champion, on, and, but I don't think that's even the right language to use in this context. So, and, but, but we also then have, on top of the operators, of course, uh, vendors, equipment manufacturers. So I, I, I feel that there is a lot of competence and um, innovation happening in Europe too. However, it is true, of course, that the digital um, applications layer at the moment is very much driven by, well, mainly US companies at this, at this stage. And whereas I don't think it's, it's, it's in a kind of, you know, it's, it doesn't need to be in sync with the internet, internet governance discussion. We still all have a role to play, um, but, but there is perhaps room for a strong European policy and, and kind of thinking in terms of industrial policy on how we can also, well, if not revive perhaps in some cases or establish um, European companies or, well, we cannot establish but encourage innovation to create further European competence, especially in critical areas such as security and, and other things. So I think there's room for imp improvement, certainly. Um, and this is not to say that Europe should be creating some kind of protectionist zone where we want to, you know, um, protect our economy from others. I don't think that at all. And we were actually previously discussing that the, from the operator's point of view. <laughs> What we need is a global market for, for example, telecom equipment manufacturers, because if we have a wide choice of, of um, manufacturers and equipment, that also then means that we can choose the most innovative products and also the most cost-effective products. So there will be an impact, of course, on the end product. In this case, in our case, the, the connectivity and the price of connectivity vis-a-vis -vis end users. So voila. <laughs> Thank you. Andrea. Um, can, I, can I ask, just um, respond to your question? Because the other one, I think from, from Eigen's point of view, there is not much to say. It was before we prepared the session, but, uh, but um, how many of you have an I, a Nokia mobile phone in their pockets? Yeah? So I think that answers your question down there. And uh, when we had the first AGF in 2006, everybody would have raised their hands, and that's no longer the case. But, um, from an ICON perspective, actually, I'm very interested in your point. There is, um, there is um, one of the um, driving forces of the evolution of the DNS has been this principle of permissionless innovation. You, Marit, from your previous work at ISOC, you remember that. Um, and the feeling that I have is that this principle has been hijacked by you know, the applications over the internet, by the move fast and break things, start big and, uh, and fail bigger, you know? But the technical community at that layer 
Um, the, the, the permissionless innovation stopped 30 years ago when Tim Berners-Lee uh, came with the World Wide Web and the, and, uh, and the invention of the web. I mean, the DNS is a space that is open by itself. And it's just a month ago celebrated 50 years anniversary. We'll be very surprised if in 50 years we'll still be discussing about the DNS. That would mean that the permissionless innovation has been completely hijacked, you know? So, uh, Europeans, I mean, uh, I, don't know, I, don't, I don't have the statistics, but there must be thousands of network engineers here, you know, in, in Europe. Well, participate in ICANN, in IETF, and develop the new standards and address these issues from the European perspective if, to build the next level of the internet, bearing in mind that the, the principle of singularity, of having one single network, is still, I believe, uh, one fundamental value that cannot be put in uh, question by the permissionless innovation abuse, in my, way, in my view, of the applications of the internet. So, I stop here, I think it was clear. Thank you very much. So, let's take the bets for the 50 years uh, from now on, on DNS and see. I have two more questions, I will take them in a row. So, question here, one and then there. And then we have a, a reaction, um, and I invite you to react to the four of you. We have six minutes, so let's take the two questions first. Okay. Um, I was uh, first in front of me. I'm sorry, I, you are exactly in the same line, so at the table, <laughs> sorry. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm Alexandra okay. Lutz. I work for a uh, green French MEP at the European Parliament. Um, I think it was an interesting discussion, especially uh, given that today we're speaking also on how we protect the values that are dear to the EU and how we can ensure that innovation is driven by, well, ethical, sustainable and human-centric internet. And I want to address a governance issue that hasn't really been addressed much yet by the IGF and whether you could absolutely take a lead, uh, which is the environmental reality of the internet, maybe in terms of material impact, energy consumption impact. We know that the new commission that got elected today uh, made both huge commitments on attaining the climate neutrality, but also on digital transition. So my question to you is, uh, do you envision the EU taking up that role and the lead in the matter? Thank you very much. I will directly take the next question and then have you react on that. Hello. Um, so Alex's question is, how does ICANN centralized model fit in a decentralized web 3.0 paradigm? So that's a lot of concept. Um, Web3 paradigm um, may not be a word for everyone in this room. Um, so maybe you can give us a, very, a short definition of what you mean with Web3. Uh, Web3.0 is, I believe, the future of the internet. So it is decentralized internet where there's different, uh, there's a consensus and different nodes. So I think the internet will become more peer to peer. So I'm just really wondering how a centralized system that is, that is ruled and governed by a few companies today with monopolies, not just net neutrality, but also content and content moderation, um, how will that change in the future? Thank you. Um, is it a bit clearer for the people in the room what Web3? Web3 uh, refers normally to um, blockchain-based internet, so where you decentralize the, the system of um, exchange of data, if I get that right, maybe to try to explain that. Is it? Okay, perfect. So we have a question, this is for ICANN, but then I would like first a reaction on the environmental uh, aspect, um, and then on that question of decentralization. Okay, uh, so it's so we have a new commission now uh, in place since uh, this afternoon, and this is one of the key priority of this uh, of this commission, as you have seen, uh, the um, uh, the green deal. So uh, and clearly, ICT is a big part of it on two counts. On one side, uh, ICT is consuming a lot of uh, a lot of energy. Uh, it's producing a lot of uh, CO two. 
uh, and that needs to be curbed. I mean, we cannot have an internet that is uh, growing in the, the, the flow of data, in the quantity of data, and the, the quantity of energy used to process this data, to, to uh, uh, send this data, uh, follows the same curve that we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, have. So it's very important that we invest indeed in green ICT, in greener uh, uh, storage uh, capacities, for example. But then th there is, the, I think, even the more interesting question, which is how we can use ICT uh, to achieve uh, sustainable development goals in general and in particular development goals that have to see with uh, climate uh, action. And there, if you think about AI, if you think about uh, IoT, if you think about uh, how we can build smarter cities with uh, data coming from citizens, coming from connected objects, I think ICT has a huge, huge contribution to make in terms of uh, uh, achieving the, those, uh, those objectives. So I think these are the two uh, areas uh, that for sure we are going to invest in the, in the, in the, Euro in the European Union. And, and this, is, yeah, this is a topic uh, for sure for, uh, for, for the IGF, I agree. And maybe just on, on, on decentralization, uh, I heard, I think it was Angela Merkel yesterday who sp spoke about a decentralized uh, uh, internet. And in, in a way that would be going back to what the internet was initially. The internet is a decentralized network the robustness of the internet comes from the fact that it is decentralized. And maybe we have lost part of this uh, decentralization feature uh, with the advent of uh, big, uh, uh, big players who have, it's clear, they have market power, they have uh, large quantities of data. Uh, so there, is a, a, there has been a centralization movement, but now we have an opportunity with blockchain, but also, also with other technologies to uh, reintroduce uh, uh, decentralization in the functioning of the, of the internet. And uh, I think, uh, for example, data governance uh, is an area where we really have to invest into decentralization models, and we have a number of them that exist. Here I would maybe quote a project that we, quite successful project that we have, uh, that is coming to an end, it's called Decode, and we have a representative uh, in the room where we have demonstrated that you can have decentralized data governance system which are used by large players, by big municipalities to uh, provide uh, improved services, public services or, or commercial ones. So that's definitely also a very important uh, uh, area to explore. Thank you. So the clock tells me we have 30 seconds, um, which is not completely true because we started um, with 57 minutes, so we, we uh, I mean, the system owes you, owes you and us uh, three minutes, and I will use them to, to ask for a last uh, sentence. Olivia, you just talked, uh, so I will go to uh, Julia. You want to say something as a conclusion, and then I will ask you to also. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, as a conclusion, I think, I, first of all, I, would say I really appreciate the question about um, your question about the, the, the sustainability. And I think that's one of the biggest blind spots, although we, many of us are aware of it. Um, but in general, I would like to say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking profoundly European in the sense that I trust our democratic governments and I trust in the regulation which is coming from our democratic governments. That's not the same case all around the world. But I think in particular in Europe, we can use this trust also to actually really ask them for action uh, when it comes to these issues, decentralization, new models, for, be it technological models or be it new economic models. I think one of the main problems we have had in the past is that we do not regulate into the existing economic models. And I think we do have to do this, and it will hurt, but it will even hurt more if we don't do it. Uh, so I think that's something with the new commission really hope um, will, will have the confidence to do and really think when we think about a new digital government system, that we really think along the lines of sustainability um, and also about a really human-centered economic um, governance for the digital infrastructure. And I keep it at that because I know we don't have much time. Thank you, Julia. Marit? Yes, maybe just uh, quickly to say in the regulation, I didn't talk about that at all, but uh, it is very important to have the balance not to regulate so early that you actually then stifle innovation and that you can also have a basis already to understand the technology so that you can have time-proof regulation. So whereas we agree that regulation and policy has its role, 
let's not do it too early so that we actually are then uh, shutting down opportunities. I also applaud the green question um, and would just like to say that Eton is very active on this and in fact this was one of the key items on our policy agenda as our members are already doing a lot of voluntary work on this and we'd like to surely be also leaders in this respect from the industry's perspective in Europe. So, thank you. Thank you, Andrea. So in my closing, I wanted also to reply to the question before. And, um, you know, you were on the big screen there when, when you asked the question, and I was looking at your T-shirt. And it's an Aladdin T-shirt. So Aladdin is flying on a carpet, you know? And so far, the internet has been the carpet. The DNS has been the carpet, you know, which is one. If Aladdin had thousands of little carpets, you wouldn't be flying. So I think this is something that we have to um, appreciate, how important it is that so far we have been having, yes, I mean, maybe you don't like flying, I don't know, but, uh, but if a new model comes in, and if blockchain, if it decentralizes the quantum internet, you know, no matter how you can label it, I think the important thing is to ensure that uh, we are all on one single network. And we can, you know, we will be 7 billion of internet users one day, 50 billion of devices or more, but we are all on one single platform. And at the technical level, this is something that so far has been holding through, and we have been having this discussion because it has been holding through so far the DNS, but uh, I don't think we can take it for granted that we will speak about sustainability. I think we have to ensure also that uh, the future generations they will enjoy the same internet that we enjoyed so far. That's very similar to what's happening to the environment. No? So if we want the future generation to fly on the same carpet as Aladdin, well, make sure that the next evolution of the technology maintains this principle that has been so revolutionary so far. Thank you very much. I will wrap up. I have uh, two conclusions and one question. If we look at uh, the 10 years to come for the future of internet governance, and. Uh, um, in the context of Europe and European stakeholders, I get one thing is from internet to digital governance. I think that was something very big in that discussion. I get uh, from black internet to green internet, which was the topic at the end, but very much of support on that side. And one question, uh, centralized versus decentralized, and that was uh, something that we were more as a question in the room. I thank you very much all for your participation. Um, and hope to see you maybe tonight because I think that tonight it's going to be interesting. And yeah, have a nice evening. <laughs>